everybody, and welcome to our advanced biology series of video lessons. These lessons are really being developed for an advanced level biology course, something like an AP biology or maybe even an IB biology. I am an AP biology teacher, and so I'm creating these really for my students to use in our AP biology class, but certainly you may find them useful as well. We're going to start our course with evolution. It's going to be the first of our seven major units for the course. And we're going to start our discussions of evolution by talking about this guy right here, who's Charles Darwin and his development of the theory of natural selection. Now, it's important to understand that, like in evolution as in anything else in science, Darwin's ideas didn't come to him just totally out of the blue. He based his ideas upon other people's thoughts as well. So for a long time, people have been thinking about where living things come from. Darwin was the first one that really gave us a scientifically rigorous answer to that question. We're going to talk about what that looks like in a little bit. Here in this video, we're going to talk about what things looked like before Darwin, what Darwin did, and then we'll talk about how natural selection works, and then some conclusions from natural selection about the larger organization and history of life on Earth. So let's begin. Going back before Darwin, we're just going to spotlight a couple of the thinkers whose work was formative for Darwin's own thinking about evolution. The first of these thinkers that we're going to focus on is Thomas Malthus. Malthus's main contributions were thoughts about how populations grow over time. He had noticed that populations tend to outpace the amount of resources available to support them in their environment. And he wrote that famine seems to be the last or the most dreadful resource of nature, meaning that populations would grow and exhaust all of the resources available to them, and then they would starve to death, essentially. This notion of how populations grow is referred to generally as Malthusian theory. Charles Lyell was another of these pre-Darwinian thinkers whose work really influenced Darwin, and his major contribution was really giving rise to the field of geology. He wrote a book called Principles of Geology, and we know that this book had a big role in Darwin's thinking on this, and that Darwin actually brought this book with him on his travels around the world on the HMS Beagle. Lyell and other geological thinkers of the time were advancing a notion known as uniformitarianism, which is the idea that the processes that we see at work on Earth today are the same as the processes that have worked to shape Earth throughout history or throughout time. So we can use our investigations of what's happening on Earth now to inform our thinking about what happened in Earth back in ancient history before humans were around. This, of course, was very, very different from some of the major thinking at the time, which basically took the Bible and backdated it to Genesis in order to determine how long the Earth had been around, somewhere around 10,000 years. Uniformitarianism and other ideas like it really challenged that notion and suggested that the Earth was, in fact, much, much older than a literal biblical interpretation would lead people to believe. And the last pre-Darwinian thinker that we're going to spotlight here is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who actually put forth some thoughts about how living things evolved before Darwin did. Lamarck's evolution was a notion of use or disuse. The idea that as individuals live their lives and use certain aspects of their anatomy or their behavior or their physiology, those things would be strengthened and passed on in enhanced forms to the next generation. Of course, the opposite would happen as well. Structures and behaviors that individuals did not use would atrophy or get weaker, and they would be passed on to the next generation in weakened forms. It's really important to understand that this notion, which we refer to as the inheritance of acquired characteristics, is not how evolution actually works. But it's still useful to point to the work that Lamarck did to show that people were thinking about evolution and organisms changing over time before Darwin came on the scene. They might have been wrong about how it worked, but there was a robust scientific community working on these kinds of problems before Darwin ever showed up. Moving to Darwin specifically now, we can talk a little bit about his life, but certainly if you want the full details, I would encourage you to go and check out some of the resources that I've left in the information below the video. Or of course, you could always just Google search for it and you'll get a lot more than what you're about to get here. Darwin was very much a member of the polite society of England in the 19th century. And what this really means is that his family was well off enough so that he could entertain doing all sorts of things in his career. He wasn't forced to go and do any one particular thing. And he tended to actually be pretty bad at what he wanted to do. So for instance, he tried to be a physician for a period of time, but he really found the operating theater of the 19th century rather distasteful. And so he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do, but he always had an aptitude for the natural sciences. And so the opportunity came along for him to become the ship's naturalist on board the HMS Beagle, which was going on a trip around the world. This voyage took something like five years to accomplish. As the ship's naturalist, Darwin was responsible for collecting specimens of the different organisms that he found as the ship traveled from 
from place to place. So we had a lot of time to collect a lot of data and then to think about what that data meant. One particular location that really was important for the development of Darwin's evolutionary theory was the ship stop in the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador in South America. The Galapagos Islands are a volcanic archipelago that are far enough away from mainland South America that they have a lot of species that are only found on those islands that are far enough away from mainland South America that they are inhabited by a lot of unique species that are only found on that archipelago. There are giant tortoises and marine iguanas and species of birds that you can't find anywhere else in the world. This turned out to be really, really important for Darwin's thinking about natural selection and how natural selection works. But what's also interesting about Darwin is that he didn't publish his work on evolution for a long time after returning to England. He wrote up an account of his travels based on the journal that he kept, and that sold well enough so that he could basically live off the money that he made from that, combined with his family's money. And he started to get a reputation as one of the most well-known geologists in England. He also told some of his friends, who were among the most preeminent scientists of their day in England, about his theories of evolution, but as far as the public knew, he didn't have any thoughts on the topic. It wasn't until 20 years later when he was contacted by a young naturalist named Alfred Russell Wallace who wanted to share a theory of evolution that he had developed that was almost exactly like Darwin's, that Darwin was spurred to publish his findings. The title of Wallace's paper was On the Tendency of Species to Depart Indefinitely from Their Original Type, but Darwin had a catchier title. He published his thoughts in the most famous book in all of biology, which is titled On the Origin of Species, a book that would see six different editions over the course of his life that he kept adding to. And it's important to recognize that while it's typical to give Darwin all of the credit, Darwin and Wallace both gave each other mutual credit for developing the theory of natural selection. So let's step away from the life of Darwin, and now let's actually look at how natural selection works. Natural selection is not a complicated process. It's based on some of the most obvious characteristics of life that are already evident to you as a student who just thinks about these things. I like to think of natural selection basically as a cycle. Something that repeats from generation to generation. And I've broken it down here into six different steps. We're going to go in and talk about each one individually and how they all work together to drive natural selection in the environment. The first is the notion of variation among all living things. It's probably obvious to you that every member of every generation is unique in some ways. This might not be so obvious with organisms like ladybugs because you don't spend a lot of time thinking and looking at ladybugs. But here's a picture of some ladybugs and you can see that each one of these ladybugs has slight or even not so slight differences in their coloration and the pattern of spots. And if we watched them at work, we'd see that they have variations in their behaviors as well. This is true of all members of all generations of all organisms, from bacteria to ladybugs to trees to elephants and of course to humans as well. Variation is the raw material necessary for evolution and we'll talk a lot more about where variation comes from over the span of this course. The next observation that you need to understand for natural selection is this notion of overproduction of offspring. And this comes from Thomas Malthus, if you go back and think about what he said. Every generation produces more offspring than the environment could possibly support. Not all of these ladybugs are going to survive. In fact, very few of them are going to survive. And that's true for all species on the planet. There are always more offspring produced than the environment can support. As a result, organisms need to compete for resources. Ladybugs eat aphids. Some members of any generation are going to be luckier and better adapted for their environment, and so they're going to survive and outcompete those members of their generation who aren't as good or as lucky as they are. This is going to lead to differential success among individuals in a particular generation. Darwin's term for this was fitness. What he meant here was that some organisms would be better at surviving and reproducing than other organisms would. It's important to understand that the Darwinian notion of fitness doesn't mean the strongest or the fastest or the most able to go in and wreck shop. Really what we're talking about here is the ability of some members of a generation to survive and reproduce and outcompete other members of the generation. Those members of the generation that compete successfully and survive are the ones that are fit. The ones that can't survive, that can't find aphids to eat, are not fit. They won't survive and they won't get to reproduce. When those most fit members of the population survive and reproduce, they're going to pass on a lot of the variations that make them well adapted for their environment to the members of the next generation. This cycle is going to repeat from generation to generation to generation. And as long as it continues to function, over time, the members of any particular population are going to become more fit or better adapted for their environment. This is natural selection and how it functions as one of the major driving forces for the evolution of life on Earth. Another way to put it is to say that natural selection leads to the adaptation of a population for its environment. The environment is determining which organisms survive and which ones don't. And since the organisms that survive have the variations that enable them to survive in that particular environment and do the best, 
over time, that population is going to become more and more adapted for the role that it plays in its environment. We should pause here and talk about one of the main misconceptions that people have about natural selection, which is the idea that natural selection is driving the population towards some sort of ultimate goal. This idea of a purpose in evolution is referred to as teleology, and it's kind of represented in a lot of the ways that we usually represent evolution. For instance, the progression from apes to hominids to men. It's easy to look at a picture like this and think that there's a directionality in evolution. Of course, that's not how evolution works. There is no purpose to natural selection. Natural selection is simply driving the adaptation of the population to the environment. To take our apes to humans example, there are four different species of great apes that currently share the planet with us. We could just as easily take our starting picture and run it through to the modern version of any of those species as well. And to look at human evolution specifically, for, for most of the time that humans and their ancestors have been on the planet, there have been multiple species of hominids on the planet at the same time. Just because Homo sapiens is the only species of hominid that still survives does not mean that there's been a driving force behind the evolutionary process to wind up with us as the end result. Of course, as we'll discuss later on in this unit, humans are still evolving as well. There's no reason to think that humans are the end result of evolution any more than it would be appropriate to think that any of the other species that we share our planet with are the end goal of the evolutionary process. It's just not how it works. To wrap up this video, let's look at two fundamental conclusions that stem from our understanding of evolutionary biology. The first is this notion of common ancestry of all living things. Every organism currently living today represents an unbroken line of descent from that first universal common ancestor of all living things. When we represent this diagrammatically, it's pretty natural to show it as a series of branching paths, which is referred to usually as a tree diagram. In fact, the tree diagram is the only diagram that Darwin put into the first edition of The Origin of Species, and you can see that right here. Modern tree diagrams are considerably more developed. So for instance, this tree diagram is based on the sequence genomes of all of the species that are represented in the tree. In case you're wondering, humans can be seen right here. But you can see that if you follow any of these branches back far enough, you'll get to one universal common ancestor. Of course, when that common ancestor lived is another major conclusion that stems from evolutionary biology. There's the idea of deep history of the Earth. The notion that the Earth is older than you can conceive of. It's around four and a half billion years old which is an age that is not really possible for us to get our human brains around. Humans just really aren't good at thinking in that timescape. What that really means is that there's been a lot of time for life to evolve on Earth from that last universal common ancestor into the wide diversity of modern life that we see. And of course, we'll talk about a lot of that life and how it's organized both over the rest of this unit and throughout the rest of this course. So that wraps it up for our introduction to evolutionary biology. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how Darwin's life and the scientific thoughts of his time both contributed to the development of the theory of natural selection. Make sure that you can explain how natural selection works to produce adaptations in organisms and in populations. And make sure that you can describe the fundamental conclusions that come from evolutionary biology and natural selection. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get answers to those questions as you go forward in your studies. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.